In September of 2007, IBM was awarded the contract for the 2010 United States Census. The value of this contract is $89.5 million over the course of nine years. This is the same company that undertook the 1890 U.S. Census. The same company that was contracted by Germany's Third Reich to undertake census operations and similar advanced people counting and registration technologies. IBM Germany not only headcounted the populace, but invented the racial census. They not only listed religious affiliation, but bloodline going back generations. This was Nazi data lust. Not only to count the Jews and other non-compliant races, but to identify them. And this is the same company that was contracted by the Third Reich to lease the whole earth machine to the Nazis from 1933 to 1945. So let's take a trip to the past and see where it all began. To find out what really happened, we thought it necessary to call upon an authority on the matter. New York Times best-selling author, Edwin Black. So how was it all done? Well, you could count on your hands and on your toes. But prior to the invention of the Hollerith Punch Card in the 1890s for the United States Census Bureau, there was no way to match an individual with cross-tabulated information about his environment, his characteristics, and his persona. All that information can be stored in the holes that are punched into rows and columns by an IBM punch card system. And then as that card passes through a reader, it detects the hole, reads the hole, and discovers the information laden within that punch card. And, and then at the rate of 64,000 cards per hour, the Nazis could determine, just like that, all the Jews of Polish ancestry who were coin dealers in the city of Berlin. This was information technology. And this was the gift that IBM bestowed upon Adolf Hitler. And so the Nazis came up with the idea that every single object in society would have a so-called talking number or a descriptive number. There'd be a long series of numbers, there'd be a specific number for a wristwatch, and then a wristwatch that had a gold band as opposed to a leather band would have a different number, and one which would have a crystal face would have so yet another get a number. perfect description of every product of every substance, of every material, whether it was a cord of wood, whether it was a barrel of oil, or whether it was a trainload of Jews, based on this descriptive number. In the first years after World War II, this concept of numbering everything in existence caused us to develop the barcode. And there were many formulations for the barcode, but eventually the IBM formulation for the barcode won out. And this was quite simply something that, is, that has become ubiquitous. We can find it everywhere as a product identification code. Enter RFID, Radio Frequency Identification. Radio Frequency Identification is an automatic data capture technology. It exists in the radio frequency or RF portion of the electromagnetic spectrum and it is used to uniquely identify products and objects. An RFID system consists of three components an antenna and a transceiver which are often combined into one reader and a transponder this is the tag being read the antenna uses radio frequency waves to transmit a signal that activates the transponder when activated the tag transmits data back to the antenna the data is then used to notify a programmable logic controller that an action should occur the action could be as simple as raising an access gate or opening a toll booth or as complicated as interfacing with a database to carry out a monetary transaction RFID is coming into an increasing use in the world as an alternative to the barcode. The product embedded with an RFID tag is alive and it communicates throughout its entire life cycle. The longevity of the RFID tag itself extends past the life of the product. Currently, there are no regulations protecting consumers from the abuses of this technology. They can now marry the information of an RFID tag with the individual, his likes, his dislikes, 
his problems in society, his threat to society, or can we say his perceived threat to society? And right here, let's not drop this, this is the injectable chip that is planned for patients, for dogs, for pets. The studies of Dr. Jose Delgado's research in the 1960s where he implanted electrodes into the midbrain of a normally hostile bull. By means of a remote control, he used radio frequency to short circuit the rage signals, stopping the bull before it reached the matador. A similar study on cats, where the opposite was accomplished. Rage signals were created via radio frequency, causing the cats to attack. But today, we are going to focus on the puppeteer and look at who is controlling the strings and what they have planned for the marionettes. Having been dogged by civil libertarians, privacy advocate groups, and being the butt of hacking security flaws, the death nail was sounded when Dr. Katherine Albrecht released her research article. Microchip, induced tumors in laboratory rodents and dogs, a review of the literature. This article showcased a causal link between implanted radio frequency, RFID microchip transponders, and cancer. Sharing in this study was Dr. Robert Benezra, the Director of Cancer Biology Genetics Program of the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. He went on record to say, There's no way in the world, having read this information, that I would have one of those chips implanted in my skin or in one of my family members. Given the preliminary animal data, it looks to me that there's definitely cause for concern. On Wednesday, October the 13th, 2004, the FDA approved the VeraChip RFID chip for human consumption. The radio frequency identification device contains a 16-digit patient verification number that is transmitted to a handheld radio scanner upon activation. How did VeraChip get FDA approved? With the sprinkling of Tommy Magic Dust, of course. The FDA is overseen by the Department of Health and Human Services, which at the time of VeraChip's approval was headed by Tommy Thompson. Two weeks after the device's approval took effect on January 10th, 2005, Thompson left his cabinet post and within five months was a board member of Verichip Corp and Applied Digital Solutions. Delving deeper into Verichip's blue closet, we find IBM, who of course denies any current involvement with Verichip, but as history shows, provided Applied Digital, Verichip, the necessary line of credit to continue operations, beginning their relationship in 1999. The smoking gun is also evident with the stock options IBM has of Verichip Corp and the fact that Verichip Corporation's Veramed Medical Solutions is now integrated into a hospital demonstration area of the IBM Solutions Experience Lab. This closes the case that the world's largest information company is indeed involved with the human microchipping agenda. Imagine if IBM owned any patents relating to the tracking and tracing of people using RFID. Well, buckle up because they do. On November 7th, 2002, IBM was awarded with the United States patent number 2002-016-5758, namely for the identification and tracking of persons using RFID tagged items. This patent includes a method and system for identifying and tracking persons using RFID tagged items carried on the person. Previous purchase records for each person who shops at a retail store are collected by POS terminals and stored in a transaction database. When a person carrying or wearing items having RFID tags enters the store or another designated area, an RFID tag scanner located therein scans the RFID tags on that person and reads the RFID tag information. The RFID tag information collected from the person is correlated with transaction records that are stored in the transaction database according to known correlation algorithms. Based on the results of the correlation, the exact identity of the person or certain characteristics about that person can be determined. This information is used to monitor the movement of the person through the store or other designated areas. 